Alright, parashat Bamidbar, uh, in the desert, Bamidbar. I don't know what they're eating, whatever, never mind. Anyway, according to, uh, I'm going to do a little bit introduction in terms of uh, the opinion of Rabbi Yitzchak Arama, which wrote the Sefer uh, Akeda, uh, about the, uh, the order in which Bnei Israel uh, traveled through and rested in the, in the desert. Uh, and he has a very interesting point on that. Regarding that and and the uh, and the Torah itself, so the pasuk says, "Vayidaber Hashem and Moshe ve'la'aron lemor," and God spoke to Moshe and Aharon. It says, "Ish al diglo," each man or each group of people to his tent. But here it says, "Ish" means single, al diglo to his own flag, to his own staff, beotot in their sign. Lebet avotam, according to their families, yachnu bnei Israel. This is how they're going to rest. Mineged saviv leoel moed yachnu, and that's going to each one is going to be organized in a certain order, where the center is going to be oil moed is the tent, which we have of course the uh, the, the the ark inside in the middle and so on and so forth. So according to the Ramban. The Rabbi Moshe Nachmani, uh, that meant to limit Bnei Israel or prevent Bnei Israel from coming into the Kodesh, into the Holy, as much as they were limited and they set a perimeter, I'm sorry, around Har Sinai, and beyond that secure perimeter, the Bnei Israel could not enter. It was all around it. So is the Ramban writes in his introduction to uh, Sefer, Sefer Bamidbar. It says, yagbil et hamishkan, And now the Mishkan is going to be with limited access Bamidbar when it was in the desert. Ka'asher higbil har sinai kavod. As much as Har Sinai was limited, this was also it's the same thing. And over there it says, Vehazara karev yumat. As much as it said over there, and he who is not allowed, thank you, and he who is not allowed to uh, to come in proximity to the uh, to the uh, to the tent will die. As much as it said during Har Sinai, because he's going to be stoned to death, and of course not stoned to death, but you know stoned to death, right? Not Chichen Chong, right? Anyway. And he commanded over there, They're not going to just come into the Kodesh whatever they want. If they do so, they're going to die. As, he was, as they were warned in Har Sinai, Because they're going to be out of curiosity. They're going to see what's going on. They're not prepared for this. They're not ready for that. And they're going to die. And they're going to die. And so on and so forth. This is all done as a as a measurement of honor to the uh, to the uh, to the temple itself. So Rabbi Yitzchak Arama mentioned the words of the Ramban on what we just said, and he said, "I agree with that. I, there's a point." But he holds that to the order of uh, of Bnei Israel camping. In the Midbar, there is another reason, there's another, another idea behind it, or another purpose. And that's what Bala Keda wrote in Shar Aim Bet. Nosaf al Masha Kolze, in addition to all what we said previously in terms of making a, 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 a secure perimeter that beyond that you cannot, uh, you cannot approach. So they won't come to see out of, again, curiosity. It's not respectful, right? Dugmata Agbalash and Aset Besinai, as it was done in Har Sinai, in order for them not to get closer to Hashem, as the Rambam writes, There is a great benefit to such a thing. Now, of course, that takes a great person to see why. Because usually what happens is... Uh, 
you know, people will take something like this and they're going to make it for a reason why they can't keep Shabbat, why they can't keep mitzvot, and blah, 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 blah. But that's every imbecile can do. Look at the negative. The thing is to find the real reason behind it. And he says there's a tremendous benefit to that. And the benefit for that is, it goes like this, Mitzat shem matzavan al ha'ofen ahu ha'meyuchad ya'amidam al eichut ha'makom ahu ha'emtsai ha'nichbad asher bo ha'aron ha'brit ve'aron ha'edut and everything else is there. That's going to give them a certain appreciation and respect to the Aaron. What's the appreciation? K'mo she'amu, as they say, nimtza ha'omed ba'mizrach ma'chzir panav la'ma'arav as we said before, if a person is east of Jerusalem, he faces west. If a person is west of Jerusalem, he faces east. And by doing so, we all gather our, our praying energy, spiritual, towards that place, which is directed, as Yerushalayim is, to the Kodesh HaKodeshim, to the Mikdash, and by, by the way, that's the Halakha in the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch says if a person doesn't know where he is, right, he closes his eyes and, and, and contemplate on Kodesh HaKodeshim like he's standing over there. That creates a tremendous spiritual energy, and therefore everybody's praying to the same thing. I want to breathe in the time of the Midbar, in the desert, was a, uh, there was a cloud of glories over that. Hashem was there. Therefore, from each direction, everybody prayed to that focal point of, uh, of Am Yisrael. That was the main focal point of Am Yisrael. So now, That's the same concept in the Torah that Kadosh Baruch Hu gave it to us. Why? Why? Alpaim Amamina Mishkan. Not that they saw that everything was spread away 2,000 Amot around the Mishkan. Umachanot Alevim, Mavdilim, Beinam Uleveino. And the camp, the encampment of Shevet Levi, the tribe of Levi, was separating between, there was like a buffer zone. There was the oil, and then there was Machane Levim, and then there was Machane Israel. And the courtyard separates between the Levim and, and, the, uh, and the Echal. And then inside further, there is Porochet Hamasach, right, that they put over, that, uh, that uh, cover over that. And then there is one that separates between the Kodesh and Kodesh HaKodeshim. Uve Kodesh HaKodeshim, in the Holy of Holies, Ha'aron asher alav akruvim porosek nafayim. On top of the ark, we have the two angels coming like this, hovering out like they're trying to protect, right? When you're trying to hover and protect, you just go like that. And what's inside? HaTorah. HaTorah ha'elokit netuna betocho. The divine Torah is giving inside. So therefore, yaskilu ve'yedu, therefore should they should contemplate and understand that the Torah is the main thing. The Torah engulfs everything. Vehi ha-merkaz, that is the center point. Asher alav yesovevu kol ha-inyanim ha-nechbadim ha-ele. The Torah is our core condensation. What we all around and evolved around. In good things and unfortunately in bad things. Everything is the Torah. That's why the focal point of a Jew shall always be towards the Torah, not away from the Torah. As I said to you a million times, when you, for example, see any discrepancies between the Torah and science, don't try to explain the Torah according to science. You need to take science and explain science according to the Torah, from the Torah point of view. And that's something that we must understand all the time. The Torah is not secondary, but rather primary and the cause of everything that we do. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Shakon Yad Amen. Now, and ve'ikve'u benafsham, and they, they should engrave it in their heart. Heyota tachlit kol ha'ma'asim ve'ikaran. Everything that you do is the purpose of everything you do is 
the Torah. The Torah is the measurement in which you measure everything. It's the scale that was given to us to measure our actions, if they're good or they're bad, where should it be fixed, where should it not be fixed. There are boundaries of the Torah. And we'll get to later on to the whole discussions and arguments of the Torah and so on and so forth. And that concept, the desire for the Torah, should burn inside of them. I mean, like love, like burning love. Not like almost Elvis saying, right? Burning, burning love, right? And that should be engraved in you. It will be in a passionate way. All the actions that we do is for Torah. You're going to work. Is so you could learn. You're doing something in the morning, you get up so you could learn for the Torah, not away from the Torah, towards the Torah. Torah is the center, is the focal point. Gami Yihumei Mea, also though, is very poetic. The, the water of the Torah, which is, which is great and, and awesome, like an ocean, metukim sweet, maim karim al nefesh ba be'eshat avod va'tavera va'atshukot. When you're going to start learning the Torah, it's going to be like cold water over the desires of which we are all generated by to the point that we lose our mind. And I'm not even talking about just now being observant and not being observant. Anyone, any human being, that his, his, uh, his fuel is physical desires is basically doing himself to, 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 a, to a quick spiritual death with not able to achieve much. Because everything that you do, it's going to be, it's, it's, it's simply out of control. The Torah comes and teaches you how to let those desires work for you. And so on and so forth. And hopefully become more spiritual. So Bnei Israel gathered around the tent, as we said beforehand, and they saw different levels in the Mishkan, different levels of, of, you know, of holiness going from where they are into the holy. Now, when the Torah is Merkaz, so now, hopefully, understanding that and understanding the centerism of the Torah in our life, the center of the Torah is the focal point of our lives, that will cause us a great desire to the Torah. Because if something is away from you, you want to get near it. The same thing as the Gemara tells us, the Halakha tells us, when a man separates from his wife at the time of her monthly period, and then she goes to the mikveh, he desires her the day that he has in the mikveh with burning love, like the first when they were married. He loves her again. That love is being awakened. And, and therefore you need to have this, this separation from time to time. So you could desire to go there. You need to create this momentum. If you're going to pull, 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 eventually it's going to rip. You pull, come closer. You pull, come closer. You pull, you let go and come closer. That's the way it is. That motion helps you continue into, into, the, into the scheme of life, further into life, through love. This pulling, letting go, pulling, letting go, pulling, letting go. And then you go faster, you go forward. But when you are only in one direction, eventually, you know, we talked about physics today. We don't live in a vacuum. That's another reason to learn physics. Eventually, you know, it's going to fall down. Like if you take a stone or a ball, if you throw it, it will go up a certain trajectory. It's going to reach the top. Of this point at all, it's down. How are you going to continue growing with love this way? So you see how the, the Torah is also a way of life, whether it's a relationship or it's a desire for the Torah. It's so great, it's so vast, and therefore we need to do so. The same thing to create a certain sensation of we are longing to see God. We've been waiting for 2,000 years, if not more, to see the glory of God again revealed to us. 2,000 years. Because when we had it, get used to it. Eh, who cares? So Agadosh Baruch says, listen, it's important to you. Let me take it away. I'll give it back to you. But you need to realize it's, it was gone for you. It's lost from you. So I'm going to take it away now. 
the more it's taken away, the more we want. Those who give up, give up. They never had that, I guess, that true love. They never had that true love. If you love someone, it doesn't necessarily have to be like sexual love. Love someone, true love, could last for years, decades, after this person has gone from your life. I'm not talking about obsession. I'm talking about love. And if you make something so accessible, there's nothing to desire anymore because you got it. That's why I do believe that there's not much love today in relationships between husband and wife because everything is already served to you on a platter. You know, right away from the beginning, you have the smorgasbord. You know, imagine this. <laughs> imagine like this. Let's say you're going to a big banquet or a wedding or something, or going to a, uh, you know, somewhere, and somebody will tell you, we're going to feed you to a hotel. How about this? You're going to a five-star, your, your kind of hotel, right? A five-star hotel. All you can eat. Bukhari food, Uzbeki food, Mongolian food, Cherkessi food, whatever food, Japanese, Chinese but there's only one catch. The catch will be that upon entering the hotel, they're going to call you to the room and they're going to bring all the food that you're going to eat during this week into your room. On the spot. What are you going to say? Oh, wow, that's amazing. So at the beginning, you're going to start eating and then you're going to get sick. And he says, this is horrible. The food is going to go bad. Where, where, what, what kind of hotel is that? The same thing here. Not everything should be allowed to you. There should be certain things that you should work for. And the more you work for it, the more you love it. You want an example? Look at Yaakov and Rachel. He had to work for her for almost 14 years, according to one perush. Even if not, all seven years. That's a lot. I want to see which one of you will be willing to wait seven years. Of course, don't wait for a 13 year old, yeah? But seven years, seven years to marry the girl you love. You saw her. You love her. She's waiting for, willing to wait for you. But you're going to wait for her for seven years. That's love. That's love. We don't have that. We want to, can, can we take a test drive? And then you lose the, you lose the cheshek. I think test drives are stupid, I'll tell you the truth. I mean, you should go in and, uh, and do all the research beforehand. And then you're going to buy. Test drive is to persuade you to buy something that you not necessarily want. Or would not necessarily need. So this is the same also. This is the same also. It taught us that, that the Torah is the center of our lives and you need to work, elevate yourself. You can all see it, but you need to work and elevate yourself to reach it, to yearn for it. And where is it? In the Holy of Holy, in the Holy of Holies, inside the Ark. It's yours. But you need to work for it. The Zohar on Bereshit explained, oh, no, I'm sorry, on Bamidbar explained to us, the, among other things, and he says the following, according to the Zohar, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu created men, HaKadosh Baruch Hu created men, and inside of mankind was engulfing the whole secret of the universe inside. In, in our image, in our bodies. In other words, Adam and Rishon included the whole entire creation in a perfect way before the head, before the sin. And the sin caused so-called Adam and Rishon to shatter the world into a million different, you know, thousand different parts of particles that we in a way, we each and every one of us are a part of the whole. 
we know that in when they were in the Midbar, it was perfect. So have this in mind. We know that the Mishkan was in a way set up to remind us of the heavenly world. And that's the center. It's hot. That's uh, yours, by the way. Oh, over there, in the, under my bed. So, and that's something very important, especially in our days today, that we see what's going on in Israel, we see what's going on in the world, and the audacity of the world again and again and again, to blame Israel, to blame this, and so on and so forth. Even the American government are willing now to speak to the uh, United Nations to discuss the situation in Israel. Shame on you. During, during, the, during Trump, that was not, would never happen. So, shame on you. I mean, I want to see, see Mexico throwing uh, 1,500 avocados into America, you know, in, in two days. Right? What will happen? Guacamole. Guacamole, yes. Guacamole. Or, or, you know, whatever it is. A French throwing 1,500 sausages over your double, 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 oh, Shonda, a war. But 1,500 missiles, if not more, 850 in a one, in one night. <clears throat> now, I'm very proud of some of you that went yesterday to demonstrate for the solidarity of our brothers in Israel and sisters in Israel. But that's very good. It's very nice. I hope it's not going to be the last time. But it's very important to do that. Each one of us has different things. Like by, by the way, you all, we are all in, into this thing. And we need to see ourselves like this. Why? Because that's what the Zohar says. And each and every one of us could support or take part of this war. And that war, and I've been, I've been saying this for over 35 years, the war is not about Lebanon. The war is not about Gaza. The war is not about the Golan. The war is over Jerusalem. Over Jerusalem. And we are all in that fight. How could you contribute? Very simple. You can go to demonstrate. You all have access to social media. Put the truth on social media. Make sure to encourage your friends to do so. If any one of you has 100 contacts, and we have 20 people here, that's 2,000 contacts. And if each one of these 2,000 contacts have 100 contacts, well, that's a lot, man. That's a quarter of a million people. Within a finger press. And therefore our responsibility to do so. Ask your friends to help you. <clears throat> Organize. Stuff on the internet. Put the word out. I said it many, many times. At the time, I remember when we were at the other place, Mark was doing that. You know, contact your senators. Contact your representative. Whether they read it or they don't read it, it doesn't make a difference. You've got to voice your concern. Make petitions, <clears throat> sign it, send it, send emails to your representative, senators, state senators, congressmen, whether it's ACLU, ACU, ACA, whatever her name is, CD, whatever it is, CD Rob, I don't know, whatever her name is. AOC. AOC, Cortez, claiming to be Jewish, Bechavot, let's hear you. Let's hear you. <clears throat> we need to do that. Voice your concern, otherwise it's on you. And remember what I'm telling you, it's on you. So, and that's what we need to see. We need to see that each one of us, we are part of everything. And if we are all parts of one whole, so why there, by the way, so many different tribes, there are 12 tribes, why, there, why is the, the tribe and so on and so forth? And, and, and uh, what did Moshe Rabbeinu? did not initiate an integration of all the tribes. Immediately come over time, all right, no more tribes, we want nation under God, no more tribes, I call it over here. Why didn't he do that? So the secret is here, here, in this part, in parasha, to show us 
that every society is so important for us to understand. Especially, and even more so to us here in America, and the process in which America is going through. Every community, every society, human society, has to have many different individuals, many different individuals and communities who are different from one another. Not the same, different than one another. And only that collection of different parts is going to make one whole. For example, if you're going to take, you want to build a house, right? Here, you're not going to build houses. How many different parts or items go in building a house? You need to have the cement and the beams and the bricks and the mortar and the pipes and, and, and the two by fours and the, and the wiring. It, if you try to build a house only from bricks, nothing else but brick, no mortar, nothing, just bricks. Can you build a house like this? No, you ever saw the little three, uh, little three pigs, right? That's what will happen. The integrity of a building depends on how many different parts, each part doing its share, each part doing whatever it needs to be doing. But you must have it. In order to have a functioning, strong community, we must allow variety. And, of course, each, each one of us has a different job, a specific job, with specific talent, and so on and so forth. That's why the Zohar teaches us that the world was created when we are different from one another, so we could, that we will need one another. If we are all the same, I don't need you. Why do I need you? You do the same job as me. But if I'm a brick, you're a mortar. If you're a mortar, he's the water. He's water, there's a cement. Together we make something. So we would need one another. And when we would need one another, only because we realize that we need one another, then we should help one another, then we're going to become unified, and then we're going to be able to fix whatever Adam Rishon, Adam, destroyed. That's how we're going to fix it. Acknowledging and celebrate, celebrating the difference of one another. Understanding that each one of us is important as we are to the to the to the finish the, the project without my other Jew, my other person, and it doesn't make a difference. That's why Judaism is not a race. You have white Jews, black Jews, green Jews, red Jews, brown Jews, blue eyes, brown eyes. Color is not an issue. Race is not an issue. That's why Judaism is a way of life. It's not a. It's not just a religion. It's not a race, it's a way of life. And that needs to bring unity into the world by ce celebrating the importance of the individuality. And that's exactly what is not happening in our times. It is an illusion that society is putting upon you now that you are they're allowing your expression in the, in the individualism, but that it's so far from the truth that I cannot even tell you. And the problem today is that many people separate or confuse what we call uniform with unifying. Achdut ve achidut. Achdut is unity. Achidut is uniform. It sounds the same, but it's absolutely not the same. Our, our will many times is everybody's going to be like us, right? Everybody's going to believe what we believe. Everybody will think what we think. And this is the chidush. This is the new concept that, that we have here. We are different than one another because this is how we were created. This is how we were born. And that is what is good for us. That's what we need. And that's what humanity needs. Humanity needs the variety. As a society... Or as a community, that's what we need. That's why when I wanted to move back to Israel, at the beginning I was looking for is only Haredi neighborhood. 
And then I realized that that's wrong. I wanted the mixed community. I want a community that there are secular Jews inside, that there are religious Jews inside of all spectrum of, of, of Judaism in terms of like, uh, you know, Surugi Kippa, Mizrahi, this, that, the other, that's what I wanted. Because I understood that for the, for the health, for health reasons, for the well-being of my children, it will be better if they will be in a society that is, is more mixed than only uniform, because then it makes you into a small-minded person. Small-minded person. So that variety of ideas, of opinions, is very important. The Mekubalim tells us that in order for chokhmah, wisdom, to flourish and to exist, we need to have a society. If you are living in a cage, or in a cage, in a cave, all by yourself, wisdom cannot flourish, cannot spread out. And wisdom is being created and formed from arguments, from discussion, from exchanging of ideas. And that's how you reach the truth. That's exactly what we do in the Gemara, and that's what I tell you. To learn alone is no good. To learn with somebody else, that's how you reach the truth. As we say, O Chavruta, O Mituta. Either to have a body to learn, or death. What do you mean death? <laughs> death of your wisdom. You're going to stay a buffoon. You're going to make a mistake. Nobody's going to fix it for you. And, and understanding that sometimes... Uh, giving up and so on and so forth, uh, you know, or not allowing, there's going to create an animosity, sensation of oppression, like you're choking me, and, and a society that, uh, that there's no discussion, there's no exchange of ideas, not understanding that your idea, even though it's different than mine, still has a right to live, a right to exist, in a society where people are afraid to say what they, what they believe in, Right? When it becomes politically correct, and you can't say that. I mean, who said that I can't say it? Some idiot in some kind of a library in, in, a, in a college, and they decided what I should say or what not to say. What are they, the academy or something? What are they, the elders of Zion? I mean, who are they to tell me what I'm allowed to say and what I'm not allowed to say? I'm not saying go spread hatred and so on and so forth, but... And ideas, I'm entitled to my opinion, you're entitled to my opinion. But if I'm going to say something, right? If I'm going to say something, you're going to label me, so I'm going to be afraid to do so. And that is going to create anger. And that's going to create radicalism. And then your society is off balance. So we need to allow to do that. Uh, you know, we should allow people to express their, their opinions as much as we want our opinions to be heard or be able to voice them. Because today you tell me that it's not a right to do so, tomorrow when I'll be a power, I'm going to make sure that maybe you're not going to be here all around altogether. I mean, that's what happened in Nazi Germany. And that's something we need to understand. We need to listen to one another. We need to understand that each and every one of us has a free choice. And we should respect the free choice, even their opinion is different than us. You're entitled to your opinion, I'm entitled to my opinion. It doesn't mean that if, if I feel strongly about it, I should make sure to, to shut you up, because next time you're going to do the same thing to me. That's not good. And, and, and speaking and, and supporting one another, encouraging people to, to voice a change. But today, when, what, what happened, especially in America, and America is leading the, 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 you know, the, 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 you know, the whole camp with this in terms of what you could say and what you cannot say. And right away, they're going to label you. If, for example, a person thinks that, uh, I don't know, I don't know, a person doesn't like, you know, he thinks homosexuality is wrong. So right away, what are you going to tell me? You're a homophobe. You can't say that. I'm not afraid of, of, of homosexuals. Why do you call me a homophobe? So therefore, I'm not allowed to say anything. And then they go, you know, you're going to label me. You label me. I label you. So I dub thee the, un the unforgiven. You know who said that? Metallica. Metallica. 
And nothing wrong with saying Metallica either. That's pretty good. You label me, I'll label you. That's it. Why, you can only, you're the only one who can do it? And in Nazi Germany, they did the same thing. Eventually, that's what happened. And we saw in the Midrashim that, that, that the perfect order that they had, the perfect system that they have, which was what Bnei Israel did in the, in the Midbar and so on. And, uh, and according to, to the Mekubalim, again, HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world with a certain order with it. And that order exists in everything. The world is not chaos. There is a, a perfect order in the universe. That's why it's important to be organized yourself as well. Organize your time. Organize your life. When you are living in an organized manner, you take com you you assume complete ownership over your life. When there is a chaos, you allow somebody else to tell you what to do. And that's order is both in the physical and in the spiritual world. You need to understand. You need to uh, uh, create order in your life when you are aware of whatever is happening and you determine what happens in your life. When there is chaos, and chaos is introduced, is usually by people or powers that want to control you and control your life. They would implant fear and chaos in your life, so they could control you. It's called divide and conquer. And that's exactly what we're going through right now. So, Akadosh Baruch Hu opened all the gates, and when Akadosh Baruch Hu, you know, and when the gates open, in Matan Torah. When, when, when we got the Torah, Am Israel saw also the, the, the infrastructure that happened on Shamaim, right? And they saw the Malachim with certain orders. They saw Kadosh Baruch Hu, whatever, in Kisei Kavod. There are 24. What are you doing over there? They're doing 24, 22,000 different Malachim, as much as there were Shevet Levi around it. And then they saw another 12 big Malachim, three to each one set it up in a certain way and with certain so-called flags, it's called this as well spiritual. And that's why Bnei Israel saw this order and they desired that order as well. And that means that they, Bnei Israel wanted to put the heavenly order also in this world. That's why Kadosh Baruch Hu told them, this, the way you're going to travel, that's how the angels travel in Shamayim, or the spiritual, and that is your job. You need to understand that. That's what they wanted to do. However, that order can only be achieved when the Torah is the focal point of your life. And we need to understand that. There's, you can become good without the Torah. Because the Torah is called good. So if you don't live the Torah world, you can be good. Shene Emar, because it says, what does it say? Ki lekach tov natati lachem. Lekach tov, a good year, I give you a good lesson. Lekach tov, zah Torah. Torah ti al ta'azovu, don't leave my Torah. So, and, and the whole issue of, of those flags told us that ish, ish al degalo, each person to his flag, each one to his own encampment, each one has his own sign, each one has his own job, each one has his own uh, 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 you know, order in which he needs to do certain things. And, th and that is very important to give a person a Jewish name. When you give a person a Jewish name, you are, are identifying the existence of this person as an entity that has a purpose in life. The revel the, that's why it's important to have a Jewish name. Maybe you would like to call yourself, I don't know what, uh, Zygmunt. Elusha. El or, or Nikita, or I don't know, you know, whatever it is. Brezhnev, I don't know, whatever you want to call yourself. Maybe you call yourself Angelica, I don't know, for all I care. You know, however, that's very nice, but you should have a Jewish name. That name indicates the fact that you have a purpose. You are being introduced to this club of people of having a purpose in life and the purpose is to fix this world based on the model that was given to us or shown to us in the heaven and this is your password. That's why when you die, you go to Shamaim and the angel asks you, yo buddy, what's your name? And you being petrified because the angel has like thousands of eyes all like this, ah, like this all over. And you petrified. Yeah, ah, I don't know. So a merit to remember that is at the end of the tefillah, 
to say a pasuk that starts and ends with the name with the same letters of your name. Your name is your password. So if you go into the world and let's say you you're brave and uh, you say, okay, uh, what's your name? And you say Boris. Uh, there's no Boris here. Psh, next, but there's no Boris there. What's your Jewish name? I don't know. Sorry, you can't go in. You can't go in. And when you go in, they say, okay, show me now what you did. Your job. It starts with your name. That's why it's important to give Jewish names. It's important. Don't use, when somebody dies, don't call them the mitkare this. Because that's only for you, right? A get or you write a ketuba. When you mention the neshama of the person, the Jewish soul, you say his Hebrew name only. Let's say his name is uh, Bachor, and people call him Boris. You don't say Bechor, the Mitkare Boris. My mother is writing a get now, or writing a tuba. That's you calling it, you, when you mention the Neshama, the Neshama comes down. Boris doesn't come. Bechor comes. You didn't call him the right way. He stops half away. He comes down. All of a sudden he says, Boris, Bechor, the Mitkare Boris. He says, okay, uh, I guess it's not me. I'm going back up. Use only the Jewish name. So that's why the importance of a Jewish name as well. The Jewish name is your ID tag, your dog tags that you have. That's your name to be able to be identified. That's important. And that's why it's important to have the seder in the world. And we saw that Maaseh Bereshit, and we spoke about this and so on and so forth. And, and even though... Even though that, that there is sometimes there is uh, there's hatred and there is uh, there is animosity in the world and so on and so forth, at the end we need to understand that there is has to be an order and we all need to be unified together, united together, now uniform, unified, each one to his own clothing, to his own his, his own original order, and I mean imagine like this, you have a puzzle, right? And you have a puzzle with like 2,000 pieces. Each piece is different. However, guess, guess what? This is a different type of puzzle. One color, one color, all pieces are square, perfectly square. How hard it is to put this puzzle. This is not only is it it's easy, it's boring. Who wants that? The great joy of a puzzle that you have a lot of parts and then you put it all together and it's very difficult each one is different that's the that's the that's the trick in a puzzle i hate puzzles but never mind you know my kids love puzzles like my wife you know they love puzzles two thousand puzzles oh that's terrific they love this each one different they will work for it for hours recently i don't know they did a puzzle over shabbat i go downstairs like i don't know two o'clock in the morning so what are you guys doing here oh we're putting a puzzle i said you old buffoons are a big guy going to sleep. No, no, no. The puzzle is very important. <laughs> <laughs> they did 2,000 pieces of puzzle. They have a system of how to put it together. The same thing like Abdul here as well. Even though we are different and we have different opinions and so on and so forth, we need to move. We need to move out of unification. It's not that only when I... Uh, when I hear one shiur and so forth, then uh, I did the, the rest of the, I listened to Daf Yomi, and then it's okay. No, that's not. The rest of my life should not be a balagan. Everything should be in order. And the order is, as we say, the order, the order of Torah. The order of Torah. And what should guide us is the spiritual order, not the physical. We need to fulfill our spiritual needs first, then our materialistic needs, not the other way around. And the way it's, the reason why it's being done like this today, in this way, the other way around, is to simply derail your spiritual growth, and by derailing your spiritual growth, to basically divide and conquer you, to control your mind. The biggest essence you have is your mind. Your mind needs to be free, and a free mind needs to have order. The Rambam tells us the following, In other words, everything needs to be organized. Then you have Yeshuvah Dat. When you have a chaos, you can relax. So, we spoke before about, we spoke about before about the names, we spoke about the order and so on and so forth. And therefore we need to understand, we need to allow everybody to do their job. And we need to celebrate the different variety. 
And we need to look at the depth of, of Parashat Bamidbar that is usually always read before Shavuot, which according to the Zohar is the greatest day in human history, the day of Matan Torah, because then from the state of complete chaos and separation, we were able to reach a state of complete unity, complete unity. When everybody says together, Na'asev Nishma, because it says, the Torah says to us, Vayichan Sham Israel Keneged Aham. Israel means in singular fashion. So that's why Am Israel was not, was many parts to it, but they were all you, united together under the concept of getting the Torah Ki Ishechad, as they say. And that, that unity, that what allowed to have this great revelation of Har Sinai. The reason why we don't see those miracles the way they had it, we don't see spirituality the way they have it, because we are fragmented. So if you want to do so, you have to be a core of putting people together. As I said it to you all the time, core of condensation. You should be the element, in the glue in which puts Jews together. Am Israel together, not for us to be super, you know, tyrants to this or that, simply for the glory of God. And when we are not united, this is Chaz Shalom, a desecration of the glory of God. And, and, and we should understand that it's okay to be united, to be together without losing your individualism. You have to be, you, you could continue becoming an individual, but respecting and understanding that the other person has room as well. Only then, only then you can stand and receive the Torah. When there is ve'aftah and we said it a million and one time, the word ahava is identical to the word one. And without oneness and without love, you can't learn Torah. So Rabbi please, Make sure, you want to finish with all this tzara that they cause us in Israel? Not a problem. Let's unify. Let's respect one another. Not necessarily we have to agree with one another, but we have to respect one another. Look at when this chaos had happened, when Ab Israel was about to be completely divided. Bibi against this one, this one against this one, can form a government, Israeli society was thrown into a million and one pieces. On top of that, the Arabs were making a big celebration. We were divided. We got hit. We need to get united and we'll have peace. Shabbat Shalom.